All right, hello everyone. So this video will be for chapter four, lecture two. We're gonna finish up the chapter today. Um, so let me remind you guys, last time we went over balancing chemical reactions, right? And so the rest of this chapter is gonna be about um, stoichiometry. And I'm gonna introduce stoichiometry to you with a little story, right? That uh, is actually going on right now. Uh, you guys may have heard of the greenhouse effect um, and greenhouse gases. Um, now, greenhouse gases are like uh, CO2, right? Uh, water, methane, um, all of those are actually considered greenhouse gases. And, you know, in recent um, uh, history, you know, greenhouse gases now kind of become like a bad word, but actually, you know, greenhouse gases are not bad. It's not that, right? They actually help the earth uh, stay warm. Okay, without greenhouse gases, the Earth, we wouldn't be alive, right? Because it would be as cold as space. Okay, so the greenhouse gases actually traps heat from the uh, sunlight. And that's what gives us this sort of very nice, you know, ambient temperature on Earth in which, you know, a lot of life um, uh, need, right? Uh, and can thrive. Uh, but the problem is it's actually balance, right? It's not about the greenhouse gases. It's the balance between... Um, you know, incoming outgoing rays so that the earth is not too cold or too hot. Well, unfortunately, what's happened is that the balance has, you know, tipped the other way where we have too much greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And so there we're trapping too much heat uh, on earth. And so we see, you know, uh, a global temperature rise, right? And that has a lot of uh, effects, uh, negative effects uh, on, on the earth, right? Um, Everything that is you seeing now, you know, there's the increase in storms and more turbulent flights, so acidification of the ocean, all of that, right? Um, so global warming, um, we what we've measured is that um, there has been an average of 0.7 degrees Celsius rise in atmospheric temperature since the 1860, and if you look at these graphs, okay, uh, let's look at the left one, okay, it's tracking. Uh, what's going on since 1860, the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. And then on the right, it's tracking at the same time, right? Same time frame, um, tracking the global temperature. Okay, so during that same period, the atmospheric CO2 level rose 38%. And that's, you know, uh, right? That's in conjunction with this 0.7 degrees Celsius rise in global temperature. So you can ask, are the two trends causal, right? Are they, is it just a coincidence or is, you know, one, one causing the other, right? And so we're going to use stoichiometry to answer that question, basically, right? Now, one source of CO2 we know is from combustion uh, reactions, right? Remember, combustion reactions, when you take organic and you add oxygen gas, uh, you get carbon dioxide and water, right? That's also the product. So... Um, from combustion, right? And another source of CO2 is from volcanoes, okay? So how can we judge whether global warming is natural or due to our use of fossil fuels? Um, and in order to answer that question, right, we got to know the reaction. We've got to write the chemical equation between the burning of fossil fuels, which is octane. Octane, oct means eight, right? So it's an eight carbon chain and also has 18 hydrogens, okay? So octane is actually gasoline. You guys know this. When you go to the gas pump, right, and you have that, that little number uh, right by the pump, there's like three pumps, and it's like, you know, uh, 87, 89, 92, you know? Those are called octane ratings, right? Um, uh, and it just tells you, you know, uh, how much octane is in there, okay? So now we, we burn that, and what do we get out? We get um, CO2 and water, right? Um, that's what come out of our tailpipe. And as you can see here, um, for every, if you balance the equation, right, you got a two in front of octane, 25 in front of oxygen, 16 in front of carbon dioxide, and 18 in front of water, okay? You guys can verify for yourself how to balance that equation, okay? But that, what is that telling us? You know, so what, uh, 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 this equation is basically telling us a recipe, Okay, so the way to read this is like for every two molecules of octane that is burned, you produce a 16 
molecules of CO2, right? So eight times the amount, right? So it's a ratio of two to 16, right? Or one to eight, okay? Now imagine this, that's like saying, you know, if you consume two pounds of food and then, you know, you shit out 16 pounds, okay? That, that seems a little excessive, right? And so that's why we want to like curb that CO2 um, uh, 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 expulsion into the atmosphere, okay? <clears throat> All right, so more about this equation, right? Just so that you guys can understand at its most basic level, what, what is this equation really telling you? Like I said, it's a recipe and that's why we call that stoichiometry. So think of stoichiometry as just like a recipe, right? Like when you go into the kitchen and you're like, need to make a cheese omelet, okay? You're gonna maybe take four, four eggs and a cup of cheese to make one omelet, right? Those are all recipes, right? And the four eggs, the four is like the coefficients of these, right? Um, so same thing here, you need two uh, moles, we can scale this up, right? So two moles of octane and 25 moles of oxygen will give you 16 moles of CO2 and 18 moles of water, right? So it really gives you a recipe. Um, and so, for example, now I can do things like if I have four moles of octane, well, how much CO2 am I going to expel, right? Four is twice of this, right? So 32, okay? So you, so this uh, balance equation allows you to answer questions like that, okay? And that's exactly what stoichiometry is. We just did stoichiometry, right? It's just a ratio, okay? <clears throat> um, so that's why it's important to study stoichiometry, right? Because we want to be able to know, um, you know, how, mu how, how much we can make, right, with these ingredients, okay? How much is it going to cost us, right? Um, and it's all based on the law of conservation of mass, right? And balancing your chemical equations, which you guys already know how to do. Yeah. All right. So um, let me write this on the board. It's easier to do. All right, so when you have a balanced equation like this, you can actually get out conversion factors, right? Like the one I just said, you know, for every two moles of CaH18, right, you have 16 moles of CO2. So you can write them as a conversion factor so that you can answer questions like, okay, well, if I have six moles of octane, how much, how many moles, of CO2, right, can I get out, all right? Well, I start with six moles of octane. Octane should go on bottom. So two moles of C8H18 should go on bottom. 16 moles of CO2 should go on top, okay? And so now you see it's gonna be, what is that, 48 moles of CO2, okay? So just extracting out the conversion factors, right? There's many more here. You can also say for every two moles of octane, you have 18 moles of water that gets produced, right? So you can relate any two things, either reactants or products, right? Um, now I can even relate these two together. So I can say every time, Two moles of C8H18 is re reacted. 25 moles of O2 is also used simultaneously, right? That's literally what the balance equation is telling me. So having that balance equation allows you to answer a lot of these questions, right? Um, it gives you all these information, okay? Um, and so you can make the conversion, right, between these units, okay? So... Every single time you have a balanced equation, that's how that's how it's gonna work. All right. So my analogy for stoichiometry, okay, is it's a recipe, right? So let's use making pizza as our analogy, and so you guys can see how stoichiometry works. It's just actually really simple. Let's say I want to make a pizza, one pizza, and to make this one pizza, I will need one crust, right? Five ounces of tomato sauce, 
and two cups of cheese. Okay. So now what I can do is I, I, I can say, um, if I have 10 cups of cheese, right, then how many pizzas can I make? Right. So if it takes me two cups of cheese to make one pizza and I have 10 cups of cheese, easy. You guys are going to say five pizzas. Did that quickly in your head. Right. But remember, now we have to figure out what is it that, uh, what are the mechanics of that, right? Of that problem solving. You're just using unit analysis and you're using these ratios, right? As your conversion factor. Okay. So you see that two cups of cheese makes one pizza. Okay. So 10 cups of cheese, you're going to put one pizza on top and two cups of cheese on bottom, right? So 10 divided by two gives you five. Okay. <clears throat> so stoichiometry only relates two things at a time, not more. Okay. In this case, what we re re related is the cheese versus the pizza, right? Two cups of cheese to one pizza. That's what we're relating. So stoichiometry will never relate anything more than two things at once. That makes it manageable and easy, okay? So if I'm talking about cheese and pizza, I don't care to about tomato sauce and crust, right? We're not even looking at that part of the equation, okay? We are only con concerned with how much pizza can be made from cheese. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So now we're going to do this with octane as well, right? Now, suppose we burn 22.0 moles of octane. How many moles of CO2 can form? Okay. Well, we're going to start with 22 moles of octane, right? CH18. Then we look at what two things is being related. What's being related to CH18? CO2, right? So you go and you look at the coefficients of octane, which is two, and you look at the coefficient of CO2, which is 16. You do not care about any of the other numbers because it's not mentioned, right? It's not mentioned. So you only care about the two and the 16. Now you just have to worry about what goes on top, what goes on bottom, which, you know, we've been doing this for like a thousand times. So it should be, you know, uh, pretty uh, um, uh, in instinctual now, right? So you just put 16 moles of CO2 on top because that's what you want out and two moles of octane on bottom. Okay, so that gives you 22 times 16 divided by two and 176 moles of CO2, okay? So what are, what are we trying to say here? Um, when you combust 22 moles of octane, you add 176 moles of CO2 to the atmosphere. Right, um, eight times as much, right? Okay, so now we're going to try and solve this problem, right? The world burned the equivalent of 3.7 times 10 to the 15th gram of gasoline, which is octane, in 2013. We can es estimate now how much CO2 that is, right? So let's move to the board. Jot that number down to 3.7 times 10 to the 15 grams of fossil fuel or octane uh, was burned. And then we need to figure out how much CO2, right? All right, so before we do that, I want to remind you guys of the roadmap. Remember the roadmap for these kind of problem solving, right? Let's look at it again. But this time, we have the B side, right? right? We've been doing like atoms and molecules of A, which can be converted to mole of A and then convert to grams of A, right? To go atoms, molecules to mole, remember we use Avogadro's number. Between moles and gram, we use molar mass, right? But now, in this question, in this problem, right, we are being asked how many moles of CO2, for example, is going to be produced from burning this many uh, uh, grams of A, right? So all of a sudden, you're asking me to figure out B when you give me A. So how do I make that transition from A to B? It's called the mole to mole ratio. And we just did that, right? It was the two cups of cheese to one pizza. That's the mole to mole ratio, right? In the case of burning octane, two moles of octane yield 16 moles of CO2. You see, so two to 16 
It's called a mole to mole ratio. And where do you get the mole to mole ratio? Always from the balance equation. So that's why uh, we learned that first, right? And it's important that you guys check that the reactions are balanced before you start doing the problem solving, okay? So once you get to mole of A, to get to the B side, you see there's only one way to get to the B side. There's no other highway to go from A to B, right? You have to be in mole in order to do it. So mole A can go to mole B through the mole to mole ratio. And then there you can, you can go to atoms or molecules of B through Avogadro's number, or you can go to grams of B by using the molar mass of B, right? So notice the B side is a mirror image of the A side, right? You know how everything to do. If you're on the B side, you already know how to do that, okay? Uh, the only thing that's new here that you just learned is this bridge between A and B. And how do we get there again? Mole to mole ratio, right, from the balance equation. All right, so keep this in mind, right? And we're gonna solve this problem, okay? So always write a plan. We start here at grams of octane, right? So that's grams of A. Of course, we got to go to, remember, before we can cross the bridge to B, right? Because this is A, this is B. They're two different things that are being asked. We have to get to mole. So mole of octane, okay? And then we can go to mole of CO2, right? That bridge, okay? Mole to mole ratio. And then we can go to grams. This is asking how much, okay? Uh, and in grams, right? So four steps, three steps. One, two, three, three steps, okay? So we execute 3.75 times, sorry, just 3.7 times 10 to the 15. Well, let me check that number. Yeah, it was just 3.7. Okay, times 10 to the 15 grams of CAHAT. Oh, we got to get some moles, guys. What do we need? It's called the molar mass, right? So uh, calculate that. We got 114. 0.22 grams of C8H18 on bottom and one mole of C8H18 on top, right? Because we want mole desired unit to be on top, okay? Okay, now we'll do a mole of C8H18 to mole of CO2. Remember, stoichiometry problem is always only always relating two things at a time. So what are those two things? These two. Find it in your balance equation here and here and find those numbers in front, right? Because it's telling you two moles of octane will give you 16 moles of CO2. So we want moles of CO2 on top. We put 16 moles of CO2 on top and two moles of CAH2 on the bottom. Okay, is that clear, right? Where we get these numbers? From the balance equation. Okay, and desired unit on top. Then now we just need grams of CO2. Okay, uh, so molar mass again, right? So one mole of CO2 on bottom, and 44.01 grams of CO2 on top, right? 44.01 grams is uh, uh, CO2 molar mass, right? Okay, so punch that in. One point one times ten to the sixteen grams of CO two. Okay, big number. Not surprised, right? Yep, just double checking myself. Yep, that's the right number. Okay, so let's uh, take a look back at the slides. Um, let's see how much volcano produced. Okay, 
volcano produced, look at this number here, two times 10 to the 11 kilograms per year. Okay, uh, so if we compare that to the grams of CO2, okay, well, let's put this into grams first because we're not, we're comparing apples and oranges here. So get kilograms back into grams. Let's go to the board real quick, right? It's 1,000 grams per one kilogram. So this is going to be 2 times 10 to the 14 grams of CO2 from volcanoes. And this is from um, uh, burning gasoline. Okay, so you guys see that comparison? The CO2 emitted to the environment is a hundred times greater than the CO2 emitted by a volcano, right? Um, so it's pretty conclusive that, you know, the industrial revolution has um, played a big role in putting CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, and therefore, uh, 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 increasing the global temperature, right? Okay, let's go back to our slides and do this problem. More stoichiometry, right? So during photosynthesis, Plants convert carbon dioxide and water into glucose, which is C6H12O6. According to the reaction, six CO2 gas plus six water liquid and sunlight goes to six O2 gas plus C6H12O6. Aqueous, that's glucose, okay? Suppose that a particular plant consumes 37.8 grams of CO2 in one week, assuming that there is more than enough water to present to react with all of the CO2, what mass of glucose in grams can the plant synthesize from CO2? Okay. All right, let me copy, copy down the equation. and then we'll solve the problem together. <laughs> All righty. 37, okay, so both plant consumes 37.8 grams of CO2. How much glucose synthesized? All right. So let's go to uh, our roadmap, right? Okay, remember our roadmap? You start with grams of CO2, okay? We can call that A, right? That's A. It was asking us about B, something else. So we know that we're going to have to use the mole-to-mole -mole ratio later, okay? But that means we need to convert these first to mole, okay? So let me remind you that you can't cross over to the B side until you get to moles, right? So that's why all roads lead to mole, so you can go and cross to the other side, right? So all these word problems, you know, I... I heard many students uh, in my career go, oh, I don't know how to start a problem when it's a word problem. Well, kind of do, because start with what you're given, and then you convert to moles, right? That's typically how it's going to go, okay? And then that's going to be moles of 6, which is 6, how you get from A to B, right? It's the mole to mole ratio. And then you can get to grams of C6, six. It's the same thing every time, okay? Just three steps. So 37.8 grams of CO2. I'm gonna convert to mole. So one mole of CO2 on top 
44.01 grams of CO2 on bottom. All right. So again, guys, right? Stoichiometry problems only relating two things. What are those two things? What's your A and B? This one and that one. Find it in the equation. There's A. There's B. And you don't care about anybody else. Just want the numbers in front, right? The more to more ratio. That's six. That's one. Which one goes on top? Well, glucose. One mole of C6 is 12 of six over six moles of CO2. Okay, just like that. And then you want grams out, so molar mass, right? Um, so one mole of C6 is 12 of six on the bottom, and on top will be calculated. One eighty point one six grams of C six H twelve and six. We say case, right? That's so this number. So 25.8 grams of C6, H12, O6. Okay. Okay. Does that make sense, guys? You, know, you, you see how we executed each step, right? Um, so you guys have been doing this, you know, already. Converting between grams and mole. That's easy. You know how to do that, right? The only thing new here is that mole to mole ratio. And again, where do you get it? From the balance equation, right? So really, stoichiometry is not that bad, all right? Okay. There are more problems here. You know, you guys should uh, go through and just practice them on your own. Um, it's the only way, you know, to, to get, get this down. Okay. Just lots of, lots of practice. Now let's do this one. We'll do this one together. Sulfuric acid H2SO4 is a component of acid rain that forms when SO2, a pollutant reacts with oxygen and water. According to the simplified reaction, 2SO2 gas plus O2 gas plus 2H2O liquid goes to 2H2SO4 aqueous. The generation of the electricity used by a medium-sized home produces 25 kilograms of SO2 per year. Assuming that there is more than enough O2 in water, what mass of H2SO4 in kilogram can form from this much SO2? Okay. <clears throat> Let me write down the... All right, so I'm going to write down the equation, then we'll solve it. Okay, blah, 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 blah. So a home produces 25 kilograms of SO2 per year. Um, what mass of H2SO4 in kilogram forms? Right. Let's do that. All right, let's write a plan. Start with kilograms of SO2, okay? Remember, all roads need to lead to mole. So I know eventually we gotta go to grams, right? So kilograms gotta go to grams. 
to the vessel two, and then mold a vessel two. And then what's next? Ooh, how do we cross to the other side, right? Because here's my A, here's my B, right? I got to get to the other side. So mold of H2SO4 next, and then grams of H2SO4, and then kilograms of H2SO4. Right? Okay. All right, so let's execute, right? 25 kilograms of SO2. How do we get to grams, guys? You know, this is up here. It's from the prefixes, right? A thousand grams of SO2 and one kilogram of SO2 is on bottom. So they cancel. Okay. Now, grams to mole, so one mole of SO2. Sixty-four point oh seven grams of SO two. Oh, and then next mole of this thing to mole that thing, right? How do we do that, guys? Mole to mole ratio. Where do you find it? From the balance equation. Okay, so we want to get to moles of H two SO four. So that should go on top. The coefficient is two. So two moles of H2SO4 on top and two moles of SO2 on bottom. Okay. And then what's next? Now we'll go to grams and then to kilograms. Okay. So mole to gram, molar mass, right? Now mol mol molar mass of who? Of B, right? Of H2SO4. So let's calculate that. Ninety-eight point oh nine grams of H two S O four over one mole of H two S O four, and then kilograms. Right, yeah, a thousand grams on bottom with H two S O four on top is one kilogram of H two S O four. So 38 kilograms of H2SO4. Two sig figs because of the 25, right? All right. So notice this problem wasn't that much different than the last. It's just that it started at kilogram and it wanted us to end in kilograms, right? And so we use the prefix in order to get there, okay? But every other step of the way is the same. All right, let's go back to slides. Okay, more practice for you guys here with these problems. Go ahead and do it. Um, and now let's move on to limiting reactant. Okay, so now we're going to step it up with our sto stoichiometry game. Um, we're doing stoichiometry in real life now. Okay, so notice in all these other problems that we did before, let's go back and Notice, it always says, assume that there's more than enough oxygen and water, right? So it's telling you there's plenty of the other ingredients for you to react, okay? So you didn't have to worry about those. You, know, you didn't have to worry about running out. Let's look at this problem. Assuming that there's more than enough water present to react with CO2, again, right? So these are the more simple stoichiometry problems, but they're not true to real life. In real life, you can run out of ingredients, right? Like I can't just make unlimited pizza. So like eventually I'm going to run out of something, right? And that's going to stop me from making pizza. Okay, so we are going to use that pizza example, right? To illustrate limiting reactant, theoretical yield and percent yield. Okay. So recall our pizza recipe, one crust, five ounce tomato sauce, two cups of cheese. It's going to make you one pizza, right? In real life now, let's say you're throwing a party and you want to make as many pizzas as possible. In real life, you go to your kitchen and you, real you realize I have four crusts 10 cups of cheese, 15 ounce tomato sauce. How many pizza can I actually make then, right? So you got to calculate. Um, so since 
you are given three ingredients, right? You're actually going to do three stoichiometry problems before you can get to the answer of how many pizzas you can make, okay? So first you have to ask yourself, okay, I have four crusts. How many pizzas can I make from that, right? So always go to the product first before you answer this question, okay? So uh, you have the ingredients. Go all the way to product. Four crusts, got to apply the mole to mole ratio. It's one to one. One crust to one pizza. So four crusts going to make me four pizzas. Agreed, everybody, right? Then you go to 10 cups of cheese. How many pizza can be made from 10 cups of cheese, right? So you're relating cheese and pizza now. That's a two to one, right? So um, 10 cups of cheese, one pizza on top, two cups of cheese on bottom, right? That's the mole to mole ratio we're getting from the balance equation. So 10 over two is five. Okay, so I can make five pizzas from 10 cups of cheese. Now I have 15 ounces of tomato sauce, okay? Um, how many pizza can I make then? Okay, let's look at the coefficients. Five ounces of tomato sauce can make one pizza. So 15 ounces of tomato sauce can make three, right? Because you're gonna put five at the bottom here. So 15 divided by five is three, okay? So now look at all your answers. You can make four pizzas from the crust, five pizzas from the cheese, but only three pizzas from the tomato sauce. So whatever limits you from making more pizza, it's the tomato sauce, okay? So you, you wanna see that the smallest number of pizza that can be made, whatever ingredient that is, that's limiting you to this smallest number of pizzas you can make is called the limiting reactant, right? Makes sense, right? So tomato sauce, you run out first. That's what a limiting reactant is. And the number of pizza you can make from the limiting reactant, we call this the theoretical yield, okay? Because theoretically, you can make three pizzas, okay? Now, I see mistakes made by beginners a lot, right? When it's a pizza example, I get it 100%. So I know too that you guys know the logical reasoning, okay, is there, okay? But then when we switch this to not a pizza, not crust, and it's like carbon dioxide or sulfur dioxide, somehow logic goes out the window. But, right, I'm trying to appeal to you that no, you know, the same rules apply when it, uh, even if you have chemicals, right? So you're not gonna say, oh, I can make five pizzas. That would be ridiculous, right? Like, no, you can't make five pizzas because you don't have enough tomato sauce, okay? So don't put that as your answer. Uh, I can make four pizzas. Nope, you cannot make four pizzas. You can make three pizzas, theoretically. Always pick the smallest number that you can make. And that's going to be your theoretical yield, okay? Now, some people are going to try and do this. They're going to try and tell me that they make 12 pizzas. They can make 12 pizzas. How does that make any sense, right? Because what they're doing is they're going to add the four to the five to the three. No, you do not do that, right? Do not add them together. Okay, so logically, three pizzas, all you can make, right? That's your theoretical yield. <clears throat> and here's a picture doing it, right? Four crusts make four pizza, 10 cups of cheese makes five, right? And so on and so forth, okay? So the to tomato sauce is the limiting reactant. That's what we call it. And the maximum number of pizzas you can make, which was three, right? Is called the theoretical yield, okay? So the ingredient that makes the least amount of pizza determines how many pizzas you can make, which is called the theoretical yield. Okay, make sense, All right, guys? <clears throat> now, the percent yield is um, uh, is a measurement of how good you are at making pizza, right? Or how, uh, you know, in chemistry, it would be how um, uh, efficient is the reaction, right? Um, is it going to yield you a lot of products or uh, very little, okay? So percent yield is taking the actual yield, divide by the theoretical yield times 100%, okay? So actual yield is how many pizzas you actually make. So let's say you're at the party, right? And then, uh, well, you're preparing for the party and you're trying to make the pizza and then like one of the pizza fell on the floor. So now you can only, you only have two pizzas for the party. Theoretically, you should have had three. So what is your percent yield? 67%, right? Because you only made two out of the three pizzas that you could have made, right? So that's basically what percent yield is. So two pizzas divided by three times 100, 67%. Now, when you go to chemical reactions, um, the actual yield will always be given to you, right? And the actual yield is actually what you would get in the lab. That's why it's called actual yield. You'd go perform the reaction in the lab, and then you measure your yield, that's called the actual yield. The theoretical yield is the calculated yield, 
right? What you get from the stoichiometry problem, okay? And so you're comparing how good you are of a chemist, right? Uh, the closer you get to the theory of record yield, right? Of course, the better you are um, and the higher percent yield that you would have, right? Okay, um, and there's one more term that we haven't talked about, right? The excess reactants. Okay, so let's go back um, to our pizza example and so we can see what the ex excess reactants is. Okay, so we go back here. Um, if my tomato sauce is limiting reactant, then my other two are excess. They're in excess, meaning there's leftover, right? So if I make three pizzas, I'm still going to have, you know, one crust left, right? Um, and I should have some cheese left as well. So to calculate the amount you have in excess, okay, let's go to the board. All right, so remember, theoretical yield was three pizzas. It takes one crust plus five ounce tomato plus two cups of cheese to make one pizza. Okay? And this was our theoretical yield, the TY. Okay. So we're being asked how much how much of the excess ingredients are left. Okay. So Let's say you, we want to know how many um, crusts are left, okay? So remember, we had four crusts to begin with. We had 15-ounce um, tomato sauce, and we had 10 cups of cheese to begin with, right, initially. So after making three pizzas, okay, again, we're going to apply the unit analysis game, the mole to mole ratio. We want to know how many crusts is left. So again, look at the balance equation. You want crust on top then. One crust makes one pizza. That way, pizza can cancel. So you get three crusts was used in making new pizza. So how many crusts is left? You subtract it from the initial. So four crusts initially. Minus three crusts to use. It's equal to one crust left. Okay. You guys see how that works, right? So even in answering the question of how much is left of the excess ingredients, right? Or the excess reactants, it's another stoichiometry problem. So now what if we want to know how much cheese is left? Right? We do the same thing. Start with three pizzas were made. But now it's a different mono mole ratio, right? Uh, we want cheese, so it was two cups of cheese over one pizza, right? So pizza cancels. So six cups of cheese we use. How many left? Well, how many cups of cheese do we begin with? 10 cups of cheese initially minus six cups of cheese. You start is equal to four cups of cheese left. Okay. You guys see that? Okay. So you can do this with chemical reactions as well, right? You can ask how much is left of the excess um, compounds, right? Excess reactants. All right. Okay, so now we go to a real chemical reaction, right? Okay, so um, recall that, you know, the combustion of methane, right, had this balance equation, right? CH4 plus 2O2 goes to CO2 plus 2H2O. Okay. Um, so what that tells us is when you burn one molecule of methane or one mole of methane, you make one mole of CO2, right? Or when you burn one mole of methane, CH4, you make two moles of water, okay? So you can say all those things. Those All those are true statements, right? AKA conversion factors, okay?
Okay. So now we can ask if we have five molecules of CH4 and eight molecules of O2, which is the limiting reactant. Okay, so let's work it out. Remember, now you can see that it's a limiting reactant problem. Even if you were included in here, do you see how it gives you two ingredients, two reactants? It gives you molecules of CH4 and eight molecules of O2. That's how you know. That's a tip. That's a pro tip for you. How you know it's a limiting reactant problem? It gives you two or more uh, reactants. Okay. So that means you have to do two stoichiometry problems. First, figure out how much CO2 you can make from methane. And then figure out how much CO2 you can make from oxygen. Okay. So let's do methane first. Five molecules of methane. Let's find the mortal mole ratio. It's one CO2. So one CH4. So one to one. CO2 is on top, right? So you have five moles of CO2 or five molecules of CO2 are made, okay? Then you go to oxygen. A, oxygen, one molecule of CO2 on top, two molecules of O2 on top. Where do we get the one and the two? From the balance equation, right? One molecule of CO2 to two molecules of oxygen, okay? So we can make four molecules of CO2 from eight molecules of oxygen. So which one's the limiting reactant? Remember, pick the smaller number. From CH4, you could have made five molecules of CO2, but for O2, you can only make four. So O2 is the limiting reactant. And what do we call four molecules of CO2? The theoretical yield, okay? And what would be an excess? The methane, right, the CH4. Okay. So let's do this problem together, right? A reactant mixture contains 42 and a half milli, uh, 40, 42 and a half grams of magnesium and 33.8 grams of O2. What is the limiting reactant and theoretical yield? All right, let's do this on the board after I copy all this down. Okay. Five. What is the limit? Oh, is the and the All right, so we got the problem on the board, right? 2MG plus O2 goes to 2MGO. Um, we got a mixture of 42 and a half grams of magnesium with 33.8 grams of oxygen. And it's asking for the limiting reactant and theoretical yield. So guys, even if it didn't clue you in that it's a limiting reactant problem, again, how do you know? This is giving you amounts for two reactants, okay? So if it's giving you amounts for two reactants or more, right? then you know it's limiting the reactant problem. So however many uh, values it gives you is how many stoic problems you have to solve, okay? <clears throat> so let's do it. For, let's turn magnesium into MgO first, okay? 42 and a half grams of magnesium. Remember that we need to go to mole first, okay? Our plan always, right? It's grams to mole, grams of empty to moles of empty, then to moles of MTO, and then to uh, grams of MTO. Okay. All right, so grams of magnesium, we need to get to moles. So one mole of MG on top. And molar mass is 24.31. 24.31 grams of MG on bottom. All right, and then we go to the molar mole ratio, right? Because now we got moles of MG. We need to go to 
B side, right? What is it asking us about? The product, which is MgO. So that's going to go on top. See the number two. So two moles of MgO over two also moles of Mg. So that cancels out. Okay. Now I'm going to show you guys a trick, okay? At this point, when you're just trying to figure out that limiting reactant, you can stop at mole. Don't go to grams yet, okay? Uh, it's going to save you a step, okay? So let's just calculate right here. One point seven four eight moles of MG. Right, and I'm also keeping at least four sig figs, right? I'm not rounding yet because I'm not done. Okay. Then I go and do it for O2. Right. I'm gonna ask how much magnesium oxide can I make from 33.8 grams of O2? Okay. Go to mole first, right? So one mole of O2 on top, 32.0 grams of O2 on the bottom. Okay. And then modal mole ratio, right? So what is it? So we want the product on top. So two moles of MTO on top and one mole of M2 on bottom. Right? Where am I getting these numbers? Remember, coefficients from the balanced equation. Okay, and then let's calculate 32.8 times two divided by 32. So I get 2.113. Moles of MGO. Okay, guys. So what I do? Choose the smallest number. So it's this one, isn't it? So that's bogus now. Okay. So what's my limiting reactant? Well, what got me that number? Mg. Okay. So I know Mg is a limiting reactant. So you can just say LR. Okay. Now to calculate a theoretical yield. Um, they usually it's in it's a mass unit, okay. So we need to get the mole to the grams, and then we're done, right? So we take one point seven four eight moles of magnesium oxide. So um, one mole of MgO on the bottom. Right? And forty point three one grams of MgO on top. So it's going to be 70.5 grams of magnesium oxide can be made, okay? Or we call this the theoretical. Okay. All right. See how that works, right? So you see why we st we stopped at moles here? Because, you know, it saves you an extra step, right? Once you know the limiting reactant, then you can convert to grams. Um, but it doesn't matter. If you went all the way through the grams and you still pick the smallest number, okay? Remember that. You're always going to pick the smallest number, okay? Let's go to the slides again. Okay, let's do this one. Ammonia, NH3, can be synthesized by the reaction 2NO gas plus 5H2 gas goes to 2NH3 gas plus 2H2O gas. Starting with 86.3 grams of NO and 25.6 grams of H2, find the theoretical yield of ammonia in grams. Okay. So guys, first thing, right? Even if the slide doesn't tell you it's a limiting reactant problem, how do you know it is? Because it's giving you two amounts of Reactants. And those are reactants, so it's H2. Okay, that's how you know. All right, let's go um, to the board again. Copy the equation. UNO gas plus 5 h 2 gas. H2. 2 NH3 gas, 2 H2 Right. So remember, 
you got to go to products first before you can figure out the limiting reactant, okay? You cannot just determine that because this number is smaller is the limiting reactant. You cannot do that, okay? That's a no-no, another beginner mistake, okay? Remember, you have to solve the stoichiometry problem first before you can find the limiting reactant, okay? So let's do it for... Um, uh, and it wants a theoretical yield of a moment. Um, because here you have two products. So it will tell you, right, which one it wants. So it wants ammonia. You can ignore water. Okay. All right. So we're going to solve for ammonia using NO first, right? So we're trying to ask the question how much ammonia can be made with 86.3 grams of NO? And the plan's always the same, right, guys? Grams of NO goes to moles of NO. Then we cross the bridge, right? So NO is like A, and this and ammonia is B, right? So we go to moles B, which is moles of ammonia, and then grams of ammonia. Okay. Okay, so mole, one mole of NO on top. And what would that be? 14 plus 16, 30. 30.01 grams of NO on bottom. Okay. And then how do we go from mole A to mole B, everybody? Mole to mole ratio from the balance equation, right? We want ammonia on top. So two moles of NH3 on top over what is that? two moles of NO is on bottom, right? Where am I getting the twos? Those are the coefficients, right? Okay. And I'm going to stop here until I find the limiting reactant, right? So leave it at moles. So 86.3. Divide by 30.01, 2.876 moles of NH3. Again, leaving four sig figs, don't run too much, right? Now I'm going to do the same thing, but using hydrogen as my starting point, okay? Turn it into moles. So one mole of H2 is 2.016 grams of H2. Okay, and then next, right now, I want moles of ammonia still, so got to cross the other side, mole to mole ratio, right? Two moles of ammonia on top. Five, right? Five moles of H2 on the bottom. Okay, get the number. Five point zero seven nine. Okay. Remember what we do next? We pick the smaller number. That's this one. Okay. Okay. So this is bogus now. Don't, don't just ignore it. Okay. And then we go back to see who is the reactant that made that. That's NO. So we say NO is the living reactant. And then we solve for the theoretical yield. So 2.876 moles of ammonia. We want a mass out, right? So moles of grams. So one mole of NH3 on bottom can be like 17 0.03 grams of ammonia on top. So moles of ammonia cancels out. So we get 48.989, we want three sig figs, so it's got to round up to 49.0 grams of NH3, and this is going to be our theoretical yield. Okay. Oh, sorry. Forgot I had share screen still on, but you see that, right? So I'll analyze that. Um, 49.0 grams of ammonia. Okay, these problems you guys should practice. Okay, but let's move on to this one. Okay, so in this one, we also get to practice percent yield. So I like that. Uh, it says, we can obtain titanium metal from its oxide according to the following balance equation. TiO2 solid plus 2C goes to Ti solid plus 2CO gas. 128.6 kilograms of carbon reacts with 88.2 kilograms of TiO2, 42.8 kilograms of Ti is produced. 
find the limiting reactant, theoretical yield, and percent yield. All right. Again, guys, how can we tell that's a limiting reactant problem? Two amounts of reactant, right? It's giving you two amounts, uh, amounts of two reactants, right? So uh, one for carbon and one for TiO2. And then here, do you guys see that 42.8 kilograms of TiO2 is produced? It's telling you the actual yield, right? It's giving you the actual yield because later we're going to be calculating the percent yield, okay? All right, again, let me copy it down and then we'll work it. All right, so here we got that, right? Okay, so it's just another, you know, limiting reactant problem, okay? When I do two, right, go from carbon all the way to titanium, because that's the one that wants us to find the theoretical yield, up, right? Titanium, okay? So 28.6 kilograms of carbon. Okay, of course, that's got to go to grams, right? So 1,000 grams of carbon over one kilogram of carbon. And then that's got to go to moles, right? So one mole of carbon over 12.01 grams of carbon. That cancels. And then we need to get to moles of titanium, right? We need to get to the product. But now we can cross the bridge, right? Mole to mole ratio. So what is it? Look at the numbers in front of the balance point. One mole of titanium over two moles of carbon, okay, and then get that. Okay, 1191 moles of titanium, okay. All right, and then we do it with the other number, 42 point, the other reactant, right? Uh, 42.8 kilograms of TiO2. Again, turning it into grams. And then to mole, right? One mole of TiM2 over the molar mass of TiO2, 79.87. Right, and then we get to we need to get to the product again, right? Which is titanium. So again, mole to mole ratio. What is it in front of titanium? What? One mole of Ti, and then the number in front of TiO two also one. One mole of Ti two. Okay, so we got two point eight times a thousand. Why I got seven seven. It's going to give you 536 moles. Um, let's do one more thing, basically. 535.9 moles of titanium. Okay. Remember what you do next. Pick the smaller number. So this, the window, right? So what's our limiting reactant? TiO2 is the limiting reactant. What's our theoretical yield? Well, let's calculate that. 535.9 moles of titanium. Okay, one mole of titanium on bottom. And molar mass of titanium. Well, 
47.87 grams of titanium on top. And that'll give us. I'm going to do this in scientific notation. We need how many sigmas? The way it looks like. So 2.57 times 10 to the fourth grams of titanium. Um, does it want it in kilograms? Yeah. Well, we actually should put it into kilograms because we want to compare it to the actual yield, right? So we need to put it into kilograms. So let's divide by a thousand. So we're going to get 2.57 uh, or 25.7. Uh, yeah, yeah 25.7 kilograms of uh, titanium. Oh, wait a minute. Something is uh -huh. Okay, let's go back and look at the slide. I think I might have wrote down one of the numbers wrong. I know what I did. Pulled the wrong number from the slide. So this should have been 88.2 kilograms of TiO2. Oh, sorry, guys. Um, Yeah, so it's just all the setup's going to be the same. Just replace that number, and we'll do the recalculation. So this should be 88.2. I like grabbed the wrong number. <laughs> Uh, too bad if you guys were here, you would have caught it for me. Okay, but that's all right. Let's let's do this again. So 88.2 times a thousand divided by 79.87 will give you 11. Okay, now that's going to change some things. 1104. Oh, yeah, that's definitely going to change some things. So I'm going to replace this, right? 1104 moles of TI. Times twenty seven point three seven. Okay. Erase that. And well, let's change this to kilograms anyway. So let's do a thousand grams of TI on bottom, one kilogram of TI on top. Okay. So let's recalculate this. This is going to give us fifty two point nine kilograms of TI. Okay. Ooh, okay. Yep. That's better. So this is going to be our theoretical yield. Okay. And then to get percent yield, remember what percent yield is, the formula? Actual over theoretical. Actual yield over theoretical yield times 100%. Okay. So what's our actual yield? Remember, actual yield is always going to be given to you. So it was already given to you that 42.8 kilograms was produced. And you're going to divide by the theoretical yield, which we got is 52.9 kilograms times 100%. Notice kilogram cancels. And we get 80.9%. Okay. Okay, that was much better. All righty. Let's move on back to our slides. All right. So there are more practice for you guys, right? I really suggest you guys just go out, knock like knock out like five, six of these problems right away, okay? And then, um, uh, you know, come to me if you you have need help or have questions, right? This is one of the tougher topics, right? Not just historically, um, for for students, okay? So don't feel bad if you know um, it's taking you a little bit, right? It's okay. Come to me for help. I can clear things up for you real good. Right. We'll go back to those example problems that we did. Maybe go back to the analogy of pizza. Okay. Um, that can help you. 
Okay, so we're we're nearing the end of the chapter. So the rest of the chapter deals with um, uh, some reactions that you guys should know. So definitely, we've already gone through combustion reactions, and so you guys should know know what that is, right? You add oxygen, so oxygen O two is always a reactant, and your products are always CO two and water. So these three things right here, it's never going to change, right? And then the whatever you're burning, right, can change, but anything will burn to become CO two and water. That's what combustion is. Okay, so you guys should know how to write combustion reactions and balance them. Um, so here's another example, right? So here's ethanol being burned. And we know ethanol can burn real good, right? So ethanol and O2, you still make CO2 and water. Okay. Um, alkaline metal reactions. I showed you guys a video in class of this, like if you guys remember, right? How lithium, sodium, and potassium reacts very vigorously with water. Um, and that's because you you get you know, basically a reduction of water into hydrogen gas, which is um, uh, explosive, right? And so this is why you get this very vigorous reaction and it becomes more dramatic as you go down the group, right? So as you go down the group, the atom size gets larger and the electron gets lost more easily. And so you have, you know, much more vigorous reactions. So lithium, sodium, potassium, right? On the screen there, you see potassium is um, uh, by far the most vigorous of the reactions. All right, the rest of the reactions uh, is fine. You guys don't need, you know, need to know. I just want you to know those two, right, would be the combustion and then the alkali metal reactions. Okay. So that's it, guys. That's it for chapter four. Okay, I'll see you guys again in chapter five.